Good morning, everyone. My name is Su Ling Ching, and I'm the President and CEO of the Ottawa Board of Trade. Thank you for joining us here this morning. The Ottawa Board of Trade is an independent, nonpartisan, not for profit business association. We are the voice of business for economic growth in the nation's capital, and our mission is to cultivate a thriving world class business community through leadership and partnerships. This is to this end that we have uh, created our Get Growing series through the support of the volunteers of our SME Council. All of us know that pre-COVID, uh, mental well-being is an important part of the economic growth of our community, and it has been further uh, highlighted during the pandemic. According to the 2021 Ontario Chamber of Commerce Business Confidence Survey, while 88% of small businesses believe spending on employee health was an excellent investment, only 49% had a strategy. Today, what we would like to do is explore some strategies to help business owners feel more empowered to better manage mental health in the workplace, as well as their own mental health. We're going to hear from a couple of SME owners sharing their own experiences and some mental health experts as they discuss stress responses, embracing uncertainty, and resource sharing. What we hope is at the end of this webinar, all of you who are here joining us live or watching the recorded video uh, are feeling more empowered to better manage your own mental health and to feel more confident in understanding your employees' mental health. To start us off, we have a couple of video vignettes. The first is a sharing by James Baker, who is the founder and CEO of Keynote Search and Keynote Group. Darby, please roll video. The last 20 months has been quite possibly the most challenging I've ever seen in business. Uh, we never expected to have to manage through a pandemic. No one prepared you for that. There's not an MBA course for it. It's been a it personally a very challenging time from you know catching COVID very early on in the pandemic and dealing with the stress of having to tell people you know that you know, potentially I may have seen them and passed on you know uh, the virus to them and you know but from a business standpoint um, we're a private company uh, we've got dozens of families that rely on us for their income and their kids activities putting clothes food on the table and so I've never felt a stress in the same way where we're completely out of control over what's happening in the world around us. So as good as our business is, as good as we can perform, something was beyond our control. And so you worried for the people on your team, you worried for their families, for their kids. Uh, you worried about your clients and their success. And so it created a very different level of stress and kind of mental anxiety that I've never experienced before. Um, and that uncertainty was difficult to navigate. You know, will my business survive? Um, we were very fortunate. We, we have and you know, we've thrived as the market has rebounded. But the last 20 months is probably been the most difficult in my professional career. Um, and I will say it's probably been the most difficult for a number of people I work with as well. Um, we have people who live in 400 square foot condos who have to work from home, live up and wandering outside and we've got to help them with those challenges. So the last 20 months has been trying. Um, but the support of the business community around me has been crucial for family, friends, and to go overcome that. And my hope as we kind of look in hopefully what is the rear view mirror for the pandemic, we start to look forward. And for my business is that we can enter a period of sustained, just sustained, sustained growth. But most important, we can look forward to a period where there is uh, more decisiveness from the business community. People are comfortable making big decisions for their organizations, which allow us to provide the services they need and find the people they need to allow their companies to succeed. Because the one thing I've seen during the pandemic is a nervousness for people to make change, and rightly so. Uh, the next year, I think, is going to be important for Ottawa. I think it's going to be important for Canada to ensure that our private businesses, our small businesses, which are the backbone of our economy, can recover, can gain strength, can gain momentum, and continue to you know, bring new people into their fold and help develop people's careers. 
I want to say thank you to James. Uh, many of you will know him as an award-winning business leader in Ottawa. Uh, he's also a member of the board of directors of the Ottawa Board of Trade and of course works in um, executive search and HR community. So his insights were really valuable. The next vignette is uh, brought to you by uh, Brett Wilson, who's a father, entrepreneur, and uh, philanthropist. He's best known for uh, being on three seasons of CBC's hit reality show, The Dragon's Den. He has built extensive holdings in power generation, uh, hydrocarbon production, real estate, cannabis, agriculture, sports and entertainment. His business and philanthropic leadership has brought him considerable recognition, including the Order of Canada and the Saskatchewan Order of Merit. He continues to simplify and organize his life to focus on what is most important, his family, friends and health. And his semi-autobiography, Re Redefining Success, Still Making Mistakes, is an all-time best-selling book in Canada. So please join him as he is interviewed by Nancy um, Morris, who is a volunteer with the Board of Trade and a uh, certified business psychologist. Darby, please run video. Thanks so much for being with us, Brett. It's really a pleasure to have you here. You've always been so open about your mental health journey, particularly in business. So what I really wanted to explore with you today is during the last 20 months or so with COVID and how it's um, impacted so many business owners, really interested to hear how it's impacted you personally and professionally and sort of what you noticed about your mental health journey over the last 20 months and what you've done to get through the good and the not so good days? Wow, great question. I was, uh, I was deeper than I was gonna go on question number one. <laughs> let's go there. Um, so I've been public about the fact that I do have a form of bipolar disorder and it's considered mild. I've never been medicated. I've used lots of supplements and I've been very happy uh, with the outcomes. But having said that, I do know what it's like to go through highs and lows. And uh, I don't know if it was coincidence or not, but April, March, April, of 2020, the beginning of COVID, was certainly a down. And I was dealing with firing or laying off temporarily or longer, hundreds of people. And in my various businesses, I'm a landlord, I'm a tenant, I'm a borrower, I'm a lender. And I wasn't sure if I was on the wrong side of everything as we were going into the confusion of COVID. There was the health risk of COVID, but there was also the confusion. And there's no question, I was even online using one of there's a tool called Hamilton that uh, measures depression and anxiety. And uh, I was one below extreme in terms of depression. And once again, sometimes awareness and open consideration and conversation, not so much with a counselor, but with my own team and staff who become more accommodating, accepting, you know, if I'm having a tough day or they're having a tough day. Um, there's a great line that Kelly Rudy and his daughter use, more good days than bad. And I always love that line. And so we always focus on the idea of having more good hours, more good days, more good experiences than bad, because you're not going to wipe out all the bad and you're not going to live only in the good. So last fall, by last fall, I should say, I had all of my relationships sorted out. We knew where we were with staff. We knew where we were as a landlord and a tenant. We knew we were where we were as a borrower and uh, as a lender. And so things were stabilized. And I can tell you by then, things that really materially improved for me in terms of call it depression and anxiety. And I don't quite know how to define depression, anxiety, but there's a funk, there's a disconnect, there's a discomfort that, uh, that goes with um, the space you're in, even just ordering a coffee, you know, good morning, ordering a coffee. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's one thing to say, thank you. And it's another to say, hurry up, please. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's just, we, we, had, we, I think we all have some of these challenges to varying degrees. Um, but if my team being open and candid has gone a long way towards allowing everyone, there's no, uh, there's no hidden agendas where, um, again, if it's a tough day, we know it's a tough day. So there's following up on that a little bit. We know there's a lot of people out there who are more solopreneurs or working very independently and particularly those people who are also working at home again, through your own experience and you know, the people that work around you and the other entrepreneurs that you know, who are perhaps a little bit more isolated and don't have a team, what sort of would you recommend to them to help them get through their day? 
Well, first observation is that people working from home where it's really, I mean, it's one thing to engage with those in your house, but if you live alone or you've got a cat, I mean, it's not the same as getting out. Mm -hmm. So getting out, fresh air, uh, even with COVID, fresh air was allowed. There was no there was no restriction saying you couldn't walk in a park. I, I still find it amusing that someone would bicycle wearing a mask, but that's again, personal <laughs> um, you know, away you go. But the idea of getting out and about and the, the chance to mix and mingle, whether it's Zoom or a phone call, but stay connected with people. I think that's probably one of the most important things that we were starting to lose as we went through COVID. And certainly in our office, what we decided to do was up the game relative to um, uh, sanitizing and hand washing. And you can see the space behind me. We kept social distance and uh, we did a fabulous job of keeping my team all together because we, uh, several of the people on our team were considered essential services relative to some of the businesses we run and manage. So we just made the decision that we would, again, wash our hands 15 times a day and keep separated. So as much as we mingled, we mingled in open space. So it wasn't uh, a crowded thing. So again, going back to the big picture of your question, relative to the, the stay at home solopreneur, I mean, obviously retail trade services, you can't stay at home. There's a lot of entrepreneurs who have to be out with the people. But the people who are working from home, get out of the house, get out of the house with that dog, that cat, visit a friend. I just, we're losing some of the socializing. That's a very important part of the human condition. And that's, again, I'm no psychologist, but I know what I like. Yes, absolutely. And, and you're right. A lot of research is showing how much uh, disruption, just the isolation people right. feel is causing mental well-being and you know, just, just being able to get out certainly uh, makes a difference in that. So again, just following on from that though, I've heard you say it before and I know in psychology we're learning a lot of lessons from COVID and particularly lessons for businesses to apply. As an entrepreneur and a small business owner, what lessons do you think we're learning that we're going to realize maybe in two or three years that it still looks kind of funky right now? Well, it goes back, I think, to this big picture, which is um, the idea of working from home versus working in an office. I've often said that you cannot advance your career working from home. There is only, sorry, let me just hang up on this call. <laughs> um, you can only do your job. You can't advance your career. And the reason you can't advance is you miss the coffee table conversation. You miss the elevator ride. You miss that random sitting over a burger going, what happened last night, whether it's family, friends, business, but it's all of those connections that are being lost. And so I think uh, certainly in the businesses I'm involved with, we're doing everything we can to bring the team back together and, uh, you know, I run a gym in Kelowna with 2,900 members. We got three or 400 members have suspended their memberships because they don't want to show a passport, but 2,500 do. So we're working with those that do. And those that do are clearly enjoying what they're doing. I mean, that's call it the mental and physical health associated with regular exercise. Mm -hmm. So um, for going back a little bit in our conversation, you were talking earlier about what you have done with your team and the connection and relationships you have with your team. You know, not every business owner has such a, an open relationship with their team. And one of the questions I hear, and I know is a concern to many entrepreneurs and small business owners, not only their mental health, their mental health, like we've been talking about, but the mental health and well-being of their staff and their teams. Most business owners don't have a lot of insight into mental health. If, if you could sit down in a room with a group of business owners and give them some advice or some thoughts about what you've learned about being a leader and connecting with people about their mental health in the workspace, what, what would you say? That's a, that's a great series of questions, really. Embedded there. Um, so several years ago, I happened to randomly comment on my disconnect in terms of a cycle and depression with someone. And within 72 hours, I was sitting doing what's called EMDR with a therapist. And I loved, and again, people can look up EMDR. I'm not going to get into that. There's some debate as to whether or not it works. I'm proof that it works. And again, details don't matter, but I know it works. So anyway, with EMDR, I offered it to my staff. I gave everybody four sessions. Half my staff used it, loved it. The staff that didn't use it don't know what they missed. That's fine. But it was about options and opportunity. I'm also very active in supporting a program called Hoffman. And Hoffman is a game changer for people. Again, I'm living proof. 
and all of my staff have been offered a chance to do the Hoffman process. Probably a third have experienced it. The other two thirds are fine without me again. They may not know what they're missing, but those that went have found it life changing. So I think the conversation that I'm having with you really now is about saying, I'm okay taking help. You know, I've always had a personal coach. People have asked me why I need a coach. One of my comments somewhat facetiously is Phil Mickelson probably has a sleep coach, a putting coach, a driving coach, a eating coach, a walking coach. He has a bunch of coaches. Why? So that tomorrow he can be as good as he is today and maybe better. And that's where my own personal coach has been invaluable with me. For five years, 10 years ago, for five years, we met weekly. Now it's monthly and I'm pretty feeling pretty good about the, the space and where he can help me. But it's just being open and candid about the fact that we can find ways to seek help. When I was doing my first couple of rounds of cancer treatments, I worked with a sports psychologist who commented that the genres of music, I pardon me, of comedy and, um, and inspiration, sport, were two incredibly powerful places to spend time. So I would watch movies that were based on comedy. I'd watch the movie Rudy. I've probably watched it 25 times, but it's an inspirational movie about someone who's coming from nowhere accomplishing something. And again, a lot of this is just about mental health, mental awareness, mental toughness, uh, mental engagement. Because we often talk about our health is our physical health, but I think as you're driving, it's really our, it's, a, it's our total place. It's our total well-being, and mental health, I think, drives physical health. And, and I would agree with you. I mean, if we can get to a conversation where mental health and physical health are one single conversation, then we might be able to move beyond stigma, particularly in the workplace where people are afraid of putting up their hand and saying, I'm stressed and anxious or, or whatever. So I, I can't end this conversation without referencing the pup that's wandering around in the background. Is that one of the mental health strategies that you have in the office? I don't think so. Buffy, come here, Buffy. There she comes. Come here, Buffy. Let's go. So Buffy is... Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Uh, I know that we've had the opportunity to have Brett in Ottawa a couple of times and I always find him fascinating. And I really took away from him this idea that there are tools out there to help us if we make the conversation um, at the norm. So, uh, so Nancy Morris has been a longtime uh, member and supporter of the Ottawa Board of Trade. She is a certified business psychologist who has helped who have helped help businesses of all sizes improve work performance and revenue by focusing on the psychological well-being of everyone in the organization, whether it's one person or ten thousand. She has successfully weathered the ups and downs of business ownership for 20 plus years and brings both her experience and education to every solution. Her flagship audio program, The Morse Code, has been delivered to over 3 million people worldwide, sharing quick attitude and actions of success. We're now going to play a video of learning elements of uh, provided to us from Nancy um, to help facilitate the conversation of our panel afterward. So Darby, please roll Nancy's video. Hey everyone, Nancy Morris here with a crash course on stress. I'm a certified business psychologist here in Ottawa, and what I want to cover to do with you today very quickly is what stress is and isn't, how you can manage it for yourself and help other people to manage it for themselves as well, and then how you can actually use concepts of uh, stress in business. So, like I say, we are going to go through this pretty quick, so I encourage you just to jot down um, a note or a bullet point on the ideas that really speak to you. You won't capture it all, so, so don't worry about that. But just mark down points that um, do resonate for you with a view to looking into further information later. So how is it that you define stress? What words do you use for yourself um, when you're feeling stress? You know, stress is a big concept and it can include many ideas, many words will define and describe stress. So what words do you use? And of the people around you, what words do they use when they're, we're 
they're trying to give you the message that they are feeling stressed. Do they actually use the word stress or do they use words like I'm under a great deal of pressure or I feel overwhelmed? So, you know, stress has a lot of words that we can use to define it. But what we want to do right now is be a little clearer on what it actually is. So in psychology, we define stress as the mind and body's response to your constantly changing environment. In other words, everything around you and, and even inside of you is constantly changing. And your mind and your body needs to respond to that you know, mostly subconsciously, but your mind and your body needs to respond to that. And that, in essence, creates a, a sense of stress. It's a tension. Now, as we'll talk about in a moment, that tension is good. It's when other things are happening that makes it not so good. And that's what we want to talk about is the, the two main types of stress that we talk about in psychology. The first is something known as critical stress. Now, critical stress is that high intensity but short duration kind of stress. So examples of critical stress would be, um, say, moving, moving house. And, um, you know, that it's pretty full on for a short period of time. Then you move and, um, yes, you have to start unpacking and everything, but it starts to, to calm down. So the duration is short. Maybe you start a new job or start a new business, lose a job, lose a business. Um, maybe you have a sudden financial change, either up or down. These are what we would describe as critical types of stress. After the event has occurred, there is either a real or perceived kind of change or or moving towards not so much an ending, but a, a, a change that um, is in the rear view mirror, for want of a better phrase. So, But it's really intense when you're in it. So high intensity, short duration, critical stress. Psychologically, we're actually built quite well to manage critical stress because we know that the stress we're feeling is around a specific event that is essentially in a time frame. So we're pretty good at managing that kind of stress. The stress we're not so good at, the stress that really we're talking about that gets in our way of, of our daily lives is what's known as chronic stress. And that is the incessant daily nitpicky stuff that just gets in your way. So you might have some personal habits like bad eating or not sleeping well. Um, that is a chronic kind of stress. Maybe you're in a bad personal relationship or there's something going on at work with somebody that is just driving you a bit batty, but it's every day or, or frequently over the course of a week. It's a chronic thing, ongoing financial trouble, which is pretty common right now. There's a lot of people going through ongoing financial trouble that they don't necessarily feel there's an end to. Negative self-talk is another example of chronic stress. These types of day-to-day -day stressors are what is really unhealthy, both you know, physiologically and emotionally or mentally unhealthy for you and the people around you. With critical stress, that high intensity stuff, we know it's generally a, a short duration. It is the chronic stress that feels never ending and tends to feel quite hopeless. But I want you to recognize, however, that particularly at work, there is something known as the yerkes dodson law of performance. Now, there's different models of stress and stuff, but I want to focus on this one because it's very work-related. It's very um, work performance-related for both you and the people in your organization. As you can see, it looks kind of like a bell curve. But as you can also see, on both ends of this, whether you're on the far right-hand side where you're sort of burnt out or broken down, and on the far left-hand side, you're not able to function. If you're on either side of this bell curve, you are not functioning well at all. So optimum stress, good healthy stress keeps us motivated and focused. It is that type of tension I mentioned earlier that gets us out of bed and gets our brain focused on the task at hand, gets us moving towards a performance goal or the achievement of something that's within our control. What I want you to notice is that, uh, according to this Yerkes Dodson law, is that peak performance is just over the top, just over the top of the bell curve. So you're just pushing yourself a little bit. 
It's right, um, slightly right of center. But what we also need to bear in mind is that for everybody, their peak performance could be a little bit different. It could be slightly left of that, or it could be even a little bit further right. Everybody is different in this regard. So being there is no sort of you achieve X and everybody is going to be at peak performance. It doesn't. And then build the world around you, your systems, your way of being, whatever it happens to be, so that you're at peak performance. And then as a business leader, you can also help people working with you to find that out for themselves as well. The key message here is that stress when managed well is healthy, appropriate, and better than no stress, like <laughs> better than being completely inactive and, and not moving forward. Um, and when you get on the right hand side of this peak performance chart, you want to be very mindful of how to get back. So how do you get back? How do you get to that position of peak performance? Well, remembering that stress can either help or hinder you in getting things done. One of the things to do when you're feeling that chronic day to day stress is look at how you're talking to yourself. Remember, I said a moment ago that chronic stress can include negative self-talk. Some of the self-talk is making your concepts of stress worse because excessive stress occurs when perceived demand exceeds perceived ability to cope. Now, I'm going to say that again because this is one of the things that I'd like you to write down. Excessive stress occurs when perceived demand exceeds perceived ability to cope. You'll notice the word here that I've, of course, highlighted in red. It's perception, perceived. If you believe, if you perceive that's what's being asked of you is too high, and you perceive that your ability to cope with it is low, you're going to feel excessive stress. If, as a business leader, you are creating an environment where most people in your organization will feel that their demand is high and their ability to cope is low, then everybody is going to feel stressed. But what you want to remember is that of these two things, demand and coping ability, the coping ability is the most important to focus on because that's where the negative self-talk comes in. We have a tendency to say to ourselves that we can't manage something, we can't cope, we can't do it. We have very negative language around all of that. And if you were to look back into your life, or if you were supporting someone in your organization, encouraging them to look back into their life, I have no doubt that you will be able to find examples of what you've been able to achieve that shows you that you can cope with what's going on, even if the demand is high. We don't get to where we are today without being able to cope with demand. We, we just don't. So the perception part of excessive stress is a story in your head. And what is the story? The story is about demand and it's about your ability to cope. And the most important part of that story to focus on is your ability to cope. I'm sure you can find that you have dealt with all sorts of things that you didn't think that you could. And that's where you need to be mindful of your negative self-talk and really challenge that story in your head. A couple of additional strategies for you on mitigating or reducing the impact of chronic stress in your life. Anywhere that you feel a lack of confidence in your life is worth you spending some time building on. Building confidence in um, one aspect can help you to have confidence in all aspects. So if you know for yourself that you are low in confidence, I would encourage you to, to start there, to well, maybe not start there, but, but work on that. Another thing is where can
can you be more curious in your life? Is there a subject that you'd like to learn more about or a hobby or something? Your brain really likes to be curious. It loves to learn. So doing that intentionally and consciously, um, using your brain's ability to be curious can help you to rearrange that story in your head about your ability to cope with the demands. Focusing on things that you can control rather than the stuff that you can't um, is really important when it comes to managing stress. We tend to get bogged down in all the negative stories and all the stuff that's going on in the world. And we, we say that it's stressing us out. You can't actually do anything about it. So, you know, for, for a lot of that stuff, there's nothing you can do except for manage the conversation in your head. So stay focused on that. That you can control. You can't control what's going on, but you can control how you respond to it. And then the really important part about managing stress is not shooting on yourself or other people. I'm very careful how I say that. That's because the word should is one of the nastiest words that we have in our English language. And it is a societal pressure rather than a conscious choice. So when you're talking about what you should be able to do or what you shouldn't do or whatever, you're just basically beating yourself over the head. If you're also doing that about other people, you're also beating them over the head too. So avoid using the word should. We, we tend to use it an awful lot and really it is a way to um, increase your own levels of stress by continuing to show it on yourself and other people. So quick reminder, there is uh, two primary types of stress, critical stress, which is high intensity, short duration, and chronic stress. That is the unhealthy stress that will be impacting people quite a lot these days. And it's the one that you have some control over by managing that story in your head because it's quite likely that you do have an ability to cope with what's going on when you sit back and take a look at your life story and what you've been able to do. Focus on things that you can control. Work on building your confidence. Do something that creates a sense of curiosity in your world. That's why we often say, you know, if you're feeling stressed, have a hobby. It's because we know that being curious, being a person who is learning helps to, to change the storyline in your head. And definitely, definitely, definitely drop the shoulds in your life. Work to reduce how it is that you're throwing judgment around towards yourself and other people. Now, I know I've gone over this really quickly. Of course, if you have any questions, just feel free to email me at nancy at nancymorris.com. Happy to answer any questions that you have. But please do understand that you do have an ability to cope. And you, even if the demand is high, you have an ability to cope. And I want you to, to move forward towards peak performance for, for yourself, that healthy kind of stress that helps you to be engaged and focused and productive and performing at work. All right, thanks everyone, take care. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and I welcome you to join us live now for our panel. I would also like to introduce and welcome Dr. Raj Batla. Uh, he, uh, Dr. Batla joined the Royal Ottawa Hospital in 1992. He currently holds the position of psychiatrist in chief and chief of staff at the Royal Ottawa Healthcare Group. He is an associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Ottawa and a vice chairperson of the Consent and Capacity Board of Ontario. In addition to expertise in concurrent disorders, Dr. Batla has an interest in psych psych psychiatric ethics and is a member of the editorial committee of the Journal of Ethics in Mental Health. Dr. Batla received his BA with honors from Harvard University in 1982. He obtained his MD from McGill University in 1987 and was rewarded uh, awarded the Mon Mona Bron Bronfman Shekman Award for the highest standing in psychiatry. He completed his residency training in psychiatry and fellowship in addictions at New York Medical College, where he received the Mead Johnston uh, Award in psychiatry. In 2011, Dr. Batla completed the Advanced Management Program of the Wharton School of Business, University of Pennsylvania. 
Welcome, Dr. Batla. And we, 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 and we can shorten that introduction in the future, by the way. And I'm <laughs> okay. going gonna to turn off for a second and change the lighting. Just I'll be sure, back. In I'll like be right with you. Five and meanwhile, seconds. for sure. And meanwhile, we'll introduce our final panelist, Lisa Paul, who's the Director of Operations, St. John Ambulance, Ottawa. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you very much, Suling. You're very welcome. Um, so Lisa ha is the Director of uh, Operations and she has varied experience in the fields of policing, business, adult education, mental health crisis work, medical first response and suicide intervention. Ms. Paul has served both civilian and sworn member of Ottawa Police Services, working in Ottawa's downtown and Vanier areas where she proudly found her passion for community safety even being awarded the Courtier Vanier BIA Award for keeping the community safe. She ended her career after specializing as a detective in operations, including human trafficking, prostitution, and drug investigations. Ms. Paul retired from policing due to pursue entrepreneurship, founding and operating her family business in the first aid and CPR industry. She is also the recipient of the academic medal from the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson. Her personal and professional journey with mental wellness led Lisa further into community support. Using her uh, uh, pragmatic approach to life, she ed educates her community as a mental health first aid instructor, which I'd never heard of until I met you, Lisa, <laughs> with the Mental Health Commission of Canada, as it is the National Mental Health and Wellness uh, for the Workplace Program Lead at St. John Ambulance. When not engaged in public education, she keeps her skills sharp as a crisis responder and suicide intervention specialist, supporting Ottawa and many communities throughout Canada. She's married to her partner of 19 years, Jason, and reside uh, with her six-year-old daughter in Ontario. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you for joining us. Again, so kind of you to ask for me to come back. Thanks, Suling. No, we're thrilled to have you back. And I know that you have done some webinars for us over the course of this last year, and we're very grateful for your support. And Dr. Batla, very grateful for the support of um, the Royal as well. Now, I see you have a nice friend with you in your background there. I, I do, sort of uh, just uh, keeps me company. Uh, okay. I think uh, uh, Brett talked about uh, uh, making sure you keep yourself with your company, and that's uh, a part of it, I guess. That's very good. Well, <laughs> we do have a few questions here that, oh, Nancy has one as well. I have to get one. Now we, I, we're left out, Lisa. We need one as well. <laughs> Um, we do have a few questions here, but I encourage uh, those of you who are joining us live to also uh, put your questions in the chat, but we'll get started with the ones that were sent in ahead of time as well. So um, maybe we'll start with you, Dr. Batla. Uh, one of the questions is um, um, that in order to keep my staff, given all of the uncertainty of COVID and the challenges to their business, my staff are feeling very concerned what do I do to alleviate that concern for them? Now, uh, are we talking about, sorry, one more time, specifically about COVID or? Well, yes. So this business yeah. owner is saying that, um, uh, that they want to keep their current staff, but that there's a lot of uncertainty from both the pandemic and of course, challenges to the business. And so how do they alleviate the concern of uncertainty for their staff team? Yeah, so I, I think that's a really tough one. I know Nancy Nancy's going to have some thoughts on it as well. But um, Nancy pointed out in her presentation that there are certain things you can control and th certain things you can't. And you've got to know what parts of the business uh, might be in your control, what might be changing in the pandemic and the exterior environment, and keep a focus on those. Uh, in terms of the well-being of staff, um, really important, uh, and Brett talked about this one a bit also, uh, keeping that team together, that open communication, so they kind of know where you're headed, what are the stresses uh, that are, you know, being faced by the company and the environment, because otherwise they'll have a lot of rumors, and rumors are, are really tough because they will make up the stories in their head. So as much certainty as you can provide and as much communication as you can provide. 
because uh, employees are pretty sharp. They know what's going on and you want to communicate transparently and honestly. And I think that probably builds a trust relationship as well between you and the, the employees as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. Nancy, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think Dr. Batla is absolutely right. And uh, when I used to manage people, even, you know, long ago, even when we're not talking about COVID, the, the points are, are the same. When you can provide a degree of, of um, conversation that is open and also being as, as confident as you can about what you're saying. And also, I think, acknowledging the uncertainty that exists um, and, and just recognizing it and putting it on the table. Again, as Dr. Batla says, you know, employees are very smart. We're all we're all pretty smart. So we know there's the uncertainty. So let, let's call it out. Let's not try and fudge that. Excellent. Now, um, so there's the taking care of our team, providing some clarity and, and certainty for them. Um, but there's also entrepreneurs and business owners and managers who are undergoing a lot of stress. So how do we recommend that they rebalance their own lives uh, with the continued uh, stressors of our, of our COVID world? Who's that to? Anybody? <laughs> sure. Okay, I'll start. Um, I sort of go back to the presentation is that um, the idea of encouraging, and I strongly encourage my clients who are small business owners or solopreneurs to really focus on the things that they can control, focus on uh, activities that build their curiosity. But, but, you know, really, when I'm listening to people, there is a lot of shooting going on in the world right now. And I have to be careful when I say that. Um, because, uh, you know, we, we should be able to handle these things. We should you know, be always calm and cool and collected. We tell ourselves that, and that's absolutely wrong. So to what extent is somebody really shooting on themselves or other people? I would encourage small business owners to be mindful of that within themselves, because when I'm talking to people now, they tend to be doing it more than they used to, which of course exacerbates the problem and, and really throws off uh, mental well-being balance. Excellent. Dr. Batla, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll add, add a little bit. And for those of you, and I will butcher it because there are different versions of it, but the uh, serenity prayer uh, used a lot uh, in uh, AA, but uh, for other groups as well, and just as applicable. And, and it's really uh, understanding uh, the things that you control, uh, the things that you don't, uh, the things you ca can control, you try to make the positive changes, but really it's the wisdom knowing the difference between the two. And Nancy alluded to that beautifully during her presentation about things you can control. If you're overly concerned about uh, the things you can't control, uh, it just leads to stress, anxiety, and uh, not helpful. Mm -hmm. And with uh, such an evolving world that we have today, you know, being able to maybe detach a bit from a certain outcome uh, as well, you know, and would that be helpful as well? Well, you, you can't control all the outcomes. That, no. That's the challenge. That's and the, the minute you think you can, A, you probably lost that wisdom of knowing the difference. Uh, uh, so especially during these times, uh, yes. I think that gets you into trouble if you can totally think you can control the outcomes. Very good. Thank you. Um, I know that other than work, Lisa, I'll direct this one to you. I know other than work, sometimes work is the, is the stronghold for people. Uh, people are feeling isolated. And, and now with the new variant, they might be concerned about further lockdowns, et cetera. Uh, what would you suggest that people do uh, in that case? Yeah, it's a very good concern and it's very valid, right? Mm -hmm. And again, to the point of Nancy and Dr. Batla, if we focus on what's in our control and try to let go of the stressors and the worrying about what's outside of our control, that will help us. Mm -hmm. It's going to help us to reduce that chronic stress. Uh, in my line of work, you know, in the first aid and CPR industry and in mental health, we prepare for the worst and we hope for the best. And so I think there's some wisdom and advice like that in that for entrepreneurs, small business owners or operators, what I would encourage them to do is to prepare for, uh, you know, if things do get worse, you know, we see things like new variants and all of these things that are going on. And sometimes people even still concerned about lockdowns or what will my business look like a month from now or two or four months from now. 
So if I can encourage operators, entrepreneurs, owners to sit down and write down two or three action steps that they could take this week to prepare if things do get worse, then again, they're preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. And that way, if the worst does occur, they've helped prepare a little bit. They're not completely unprepared. Sometimes putting our brain on paper will help us to rationalize those worrisome thoughts that we're having. And perhaps, you know, in the best case scenario, if things don't get any worse, then they've been prepared for something that, uh, you know, it, it didn't come true. But that's my best advice there is, you know, if we're worried about uh, COVID and, and moving forward, do some small actionable steps today, this week, that can help prepare you if things do get worse. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I, I see a question here. What is the best way to support an employee who is anxious about what their colleagues vaccination status is? And I know that this has been a topic of great controversy um, around understanding and appreciating everyone's rights. And I know OPH has directed companies uh, to create their own vaccine policies where possible. And there's some hesitancy to do that as well. Um, I know there are apps that businesses can use in order to track so that if there is any kind of outbreak that they're aware of those who are not vaccinated and can inform them quickly. And many businesses have made accommodations for those people. Um, but is there anything that any, that any of you would add around that I think I would. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead Nancy. No, no, go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm going to be really careful here. I have the doctor there in front of my name, but uh, I'm not a public health expert or, or a vaccine expert or, uh, you know, or an infectious disease expert. All of that said, though, you know, what we know to date is that the vaccines do offer a lot of protection, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, for severe illness for those who get it. So, if you have had the vaccine, there for at least some people, there's a lot of concern that somehow they're going to get it from the unvaccinated, but yet, yet the vaccine offers excellent protection if you've received it. So what you can control, back to that theme, mm -hmm. is whether or not you have received the vaccine. And once you've done that, uh, whether others have received it or not, are not unimportant but less relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say continuing to be diligent and following the protocols that, that are mandated in the, in the uh, workplace for sure. Nancy, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think the um, what we were talking about before in terms of helping a, a, an employee or a colleague who's feeling anxious about what's going on is going back to that idea of having the open conversations and appreciating and validating that person's concerns. But as Dr. Batla says, and, you know, um, reinforcing the idea that if you're vaccinated, and again, I'm not a scientist in that way either, but if you're vaccinated, then it's less likely that, that you would end up with a significant Ill illness. So, mm -hmm. but again, the open conversations, I think is really important now in the, in, uh, employment in, in the offices, in the businesses where colleagues are, are anxious and stressed, and it goes up and down too. And I'm sure Lisa can speak to this with the mental health first aid, the, the idea that one day you might be strolling along and everything is fine and you're feeling quite confident of what's going on. And then the next day you're falling apart and, and right. really the, the stress and anxiety is high. And as an employer wanting to be I think more aware of how your employees are feeling, what they're saying, how they're acting and what they're doing and stepping in with those open conversations, I think is super important at this point. Very good. Thank you. Um, Lisa, I'll direct this one to you maybe to start. What should I not say or do when I notice staff are really stressed or anxious or frustrated with colleagues or clients? What should I not say or do? <laughs> what should you not do? That's right. Well, maybe very quickly, we should not ignore it. So okay. we shouldn't ignore when we see that one of our, our coworkers or someone that we work with is stressed, anxious, frustrated, et cetera. So to kind of positively reframe this, think about this. If we saw someone at work who was bleeding, we wouldn't just ignore it and walk away and pretend like we didn't see it. We'd likely curiosity would get the better of us because we're human and we'd say, hey, my goodness, Nancy, what did you do? Let me help you with that. 
And so mental well-being needs to be looked at the same way in a workplace. We don't ignore it and pretend like we didn't notice their bad day or their bad moments. But instead, I'm going to challenge everyone on the line today to build your own knowledge and your own skills so that you can support the mental well-being of that person who's anxious and frustrated in your workplace. Because we know that we all have those days, but they're much better to get through when we have support. And it pays off, I promise. As a business psychologist, Nancy can really speak to the bottom line of it all and how it pays off on the bottom line. But I want to tell you that I see it from a cultural perspective in our organization. So, for example, a few months ago, I was on the wrong side of that bell curve Nancy was talking about. I was on that red and yellow or red and orange side and uh, that far right side. And I was burning out. And I came into the office one day and it was not my finest day of a leader. Um, trust me. But I was I was, you know, it wasn't 30 minutes before I had two staff members reach out to me and say, hey, are you OK? And it was a reach out personally, someone popped their head in the office, and the other was a reach out virtually. And what that gave me was the nudge and the support I needed to make sure that I changed my state and went on to have a, a refocused and successful day. And the reason, Suling, that that worked, and I think that my colleagues on the line today will agree, is because in a workplace, in order to have mental well-being in a workplace, you need to develop a culture where you care for each other, whether you're bleeding or whether you're having a bad day. And so how did we achieve that in our workplace at St. John? It's through practice and training. So we have all of our staff trained in things like first aid, CPR, but those mental health courses as well that Nancy mentioned, things like mental health and wellness or mental health first aid. And I'm telling you, that small investment as a business operator here at St. John has enabled our team to recognize when someone is having a bad day or a bad week or a bad month. And it's given them the skills and the confidence to help support that peer through very pragmatic tools, such as a check-in. So back to your question, what should we not do? We should not ignore it. We wanna build our confidence, build our skills to help support each other in our workplaces. That's the only way we're gonna come out of this pandemic and thrive afterwards. Fantastic, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Batlow or Nancy, anything to add to that? I, th I thought that was an excellent answer, uh, and I'm going to leave it there. Then. Okay, <laughs> very good. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was excellent. Um, so uh, someone's saying, I hear all sorts of talk about uh, people who've pivoted their businesses or even become more successful during the pandemic. I continue to struggle, and it's still figuring it out. Uh, and they're saying, what am I doing wrong? Nancy, do you have anything to say to that? Well, the, the thing that you're doing wrong, quote unquote, is the idea of comparing their outsides with your insides. And what I mean by that is we do have a natural tendency to look at somebody, make all these assumptions about what's going on. So, so first things first, let's, let's look at the reality of how you're judging or interpreting what's going on for someone else. Um, all the time, businesses go out of business and, and businesses start. Some businesses are successful. Some business, businesses fail. That's the way business has been. After mm -hmm. years and years of, of um, research and, you know, the statistics for business success and failure remain the same even now. The percentages of businesses that start and fail within a certain number of years. So starting the conversation in your mind saying, what am I doing wrong is going to lead you down an unhelpful path. So it, you can sit back and try and analyze what other businesses are doing. How have they pivoted? What can I learn? What is possible here for me? And again, going back to that idea of being curious and being investigative in how you approach what's going on is, is a far better way to start the conversation than what am I doing wrong? I appreciate it though. I mean, even, even myself, my own business, when, when everything hit, I sort of like, oh my God, and, and what do I do now? And I did lose my frame of being curious about what was going on initially. And I sort of knee jerk responded. Um, I've righted that now, but the, the key is, is what do I need to do to remain balanced in my investigation about what's going on in the business world? How can I, as a solopreneur, I'm a solopreneur, how can I learn, investigate? Of course, you know, being a part of the Board of Trade was very helpful with that because I could speak with other business owners very openly, uh, you know, networking and stuff we can't do anymore, but I was still able to contact other people on the Board of Trade and have conversations with them, um, particularly as a solopreneur, that's very, very important. 
I think entrepreneurs as well, from a psychological point of view, being an entrepreneur, you know, you have certain gifts and talents and, you know, you have a, a drive and a determination. Then all of a sudden smack March of 2020, everything was pulled out from underneath you. And what I know of the entrepreneurs that I've worked with is they went from that very confident high of I can cope with anything to oh my God, I'm in control of nothing. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> and so the plummet was fast and it was hard. And a lot of the language went to the negative first. What am I doing wrong? How have I screwed this up? You know, all that sort of language. So again, going back to the narrative, that self inner critic, smack them in the head, you know, and, and just, just look at how you're speaking to yourself. And when you notice or someone uh, encourages you in a different way to to look at how you're speaking to yourself. Um, Be very intentional about moving into the positive. It's not, what am I doing wrong? What can I learn? What's going on around me? What can I change? Et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, find people who are of a like mind, Mm -hmm. avoid the negative folks. Yep. Stay connected. Look for what you can do. I I think I'm seeing a theme in all of this actually (laughs) around control, but you're quite right, Nancy, you know, um, the things that drive entrepreneurs pre COVID are the same things that are going to assist them, you know, during this pandemic, you know, and, and their, their resources mental or otherwise might be somewhat diminished, but staying in, um, staying connected and always looking for the actionable items is a great way to go forward. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Um, can can yes. I add a little piece Please there? Please do. Just, yeah. Actually, it's back to Nancy's point because uh, mm-hmm. I really like her commentary on should. The, the question of um, the individual who asks, what am I doing wrong? And so Sorry. what I would say to folks that are looking for more patience with themselves and with others is to really take stock of your stress levels. Are you dipping into that chronic stress that Nancy's been talking about? Are you under an immediate or critical stress? And to sort of take stock of where you're at. And then, uh, you know, perhaps throughout the panel here, we can also discuss some tips to help reduce stress. Mm -hmm. But uh, really, when it comes to building patients, I would like people to, or I would encourage people to sit back and, and look at where are they now? And why are they not being as patient as perhaps they would like to be? Okay, thank you. I'm just going to add one other thing to that. Going back to what we were saying just a moment ago, uh, it's been my experience and that when we're impatient with others, we're shooting on them a lot. Mm-hmm. They should be able to do this and they should be able to do that. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, are you doing that to other people? And if you are changing that behavior will help you to become more patient. Very good. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, there was please. A, or there, there was a piece of that question on the irritability piece as well and the patient. Um, so it's a little bit on, again, Nancy's curve as when you're in the red zone and the optimal amount of stress and too little stress causes problems. You do have to find a bit of that sweet spot, even when it comes to patients. So mm-hmm. you can't be infinitely patient with things that you should not really and be patient for it. what's your definition of patient and uh you can also can't take it to the other extreme where you're irritable with everyone and impatient with everyone and uh, often by the way both in terms of irritability and patience it's a self-reflection so when you're impatient with others there's probably an element that is impatient about yourself as well so have a little closer look very cool Thank you. Lisa, can we circle back to you and, and maybe, maybe you could share some of your favorite uh, tips to help people re- reduce their stress? Yes, absolutely. And I'm sure that Dr. Batla and Nancy have some as well. Goodness. Um, but, you know, I've been uh, since a very young age in high stress careers and still continue to be to this day. And so I love to share some tips about stress management. And, uh, you know, um, one of my favorite tips is to double up on your stress busting activities. So I'll explain what this is. But Nancy talked about two different types of stress. And in order to combat that critical or immediate stress, we need to have an immediate stress buster. So something that you can have with you everywhere and all the time. And it might be something like your positive self-talk or visualization, or meditation, or for me, it's a breathing exercise. 
So when I get into those moments of critical and excessive stress and it's immediate, I have my immediate stress buster. Now, the second side of stress that Nancy discussed is chronic stress. The over a long term, long period of time, sort of that nagging stress that continues to build up. And so in order to help reduce that, we need a longer term stress busting strategy. Okay, so you can start to see the, the differences yet similarities. Uh, immediate stress needs an immediate stress buster and chronic stress needs a longer term strategy. And that could be something like, uh, you know, the hobbies that you engage in on a regular basis. Uh, could be exercise, that's a big one for me, or even just intentional self-care practices. You know, you can't call your morning coffee every morning a self-care activity, because if we're rushing out the house with the kids in the briefcase and away we go drinking our coffee and spilling it, that's not a stress-busting activity. But if we put aside some time in our day to perhaps have a very intentional coffee, then that would be self-care. And that could be something that could help reduce stress. So I hope that our, our listeners on the line today will remember that those are strategies for resilience. And those are things that uh, you, know, you can learn and that we can discuss when it comes to helping to support your mental well-being and the well-being of people in your workplace. Thank you. Nancy or Dr. Bala, do you have anything in your favorite tips that you have to share? I am um, following on from what Lisa was saying about a uh, stress buster for immediate critical mm -hmm. uh, stress. Um, I loved the analogy there. And, and for myself, what I do in those situations as I intentionally stop and I remind myself of things I've been able to cope with in the past. You know, I was talking about it in the, um, in, in the video, I jumped out of a plane once. I will mm -hmm. never do that again, but it was extremely stressful. And when I feel that I can't cope, I go back to that experience and I remind myself that I can really do things that frighten me and that really put me on an edge. And I'm, you know, successful at them, fortunately, um, <laughs> in that case. Um, so I, th I think it's that, uh, and you know, and Lisa was talking about this, being intentional, whether mm -hmm. it's for the chronic stress or the critical stress, being very intentional about your uh, practices and, and tips, I think is, is super important, being intentional about them. And I'll just add in two points, uh, ma mainly uh, from Lisa, uh, in terms of, uh, you'll notice in her response, it's pretty individual. So mm -hmm. find something that works for you. So don't copy someone else's best plans. Uh, have your own. Uh, P.S. The breathing exercise is good for lots of people. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is the short term needs a kind of a toolkit. Uh, mm -hmm. And the longer term needs a strategy. I really like that, Lisa. Thanks. And then Dr. Bala, can I use this opportunity to say there are people that use unhealthy strategies too to try and cope? Um, and we probably, you probably get, see that a lot in your work. Do you have, can you comment at all about sort of how that helps with stress in the long term? Yeah. So, so there are a few, um, actually, there are a whole bunch of unhealthy strategies. Uh, one is to ignore and mm -hmm. just carry on. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that one's a very unhealthy strategy. Um, if you think about, uh, for chronic stress in particular, yeah, this story of, which by the way is not a true story, but anyway, the frog that you put in water mm -hmm. that is slowly heated up and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and they just get used to that and they don't jump out and they get into trouble because there's hot water. Again, not a true story by the way. So, <laughs> uh, but that analogy is used a lot and a lot of people, uh, business and the people that uh, I see that run into trouble, they've gotten themselves into that situation. So, as Lisa pointed out, they did not have a strategy, right? The strategy was just to hang in there. So that's not a particularly good one. Uh, alcohol and substances is not a good one. We can get into that later as to why, but for many okay. reasons, that's not a good strategy. Uh, the, the real key though, is to have a strategy, recognize when you're getting into trouble and have some ways to mitigate it. There's a whole bunch of unhealthy strategies though. Yeah, thank you. Now we do have um, a question from our audience who is a business coach and mentor and who meets entrepreneurs who perceive critical stress as a non-ending situation. 
This causes the stress to become chronic because it's not perceived as a phase anymore. How can I help my fellow entrepreneurs build the right perception and positively reframe that? So Nancy, is that kind of your bailiwick, I think? Sure, I'll, I'll respond to that. And then of course, invite Dr. Badla and Lisa mm -hmm. too as well. Um, you're using a word in your question that's super important, this idea of perception. Mm -hmm. and reminding people that how they're experiencing what's going on around them is a perception of course it can be difficult to speak to people of that as a business coach um it, it's a little bit easier to people will will listen to you a little bit more than perhaps a boss or, or something like that and employees can can reject what's being said to them but reminding people that a significant part of their experience is a perception gives them control back and people when the idea of sort of critical stress is perceived as not temporary and it is becoming chronic stress um you know giving people that sense of control back i think is is super important and the simple act of reminding them that this is a perception how could you perceive this differently if i was coaching somebody who whose perception was um not helpful for them at that moment in time, I would look to how can you reframe that? How can you look at this differently? And worst case scenario, I would give them sort of prods and examples of alternate perspectives of something like that so that they could take that away and give themselves an opportunity to analyze that for themselves and see where they can make that change. Okay, thank you. Lisa or Dr. Other one of you? Yeah, I can. Oh, sorry. Uh, I can answer that. So um, I, I like the concept of perception and also the definition of chronic versus more acute types of stress. So I do, do hear a lot about the pandemic now being a chronic stressor. We do, however, know a lot more about it. So you can start to, and I hesitate a little bit. I'm not a business owner, so I can't put myself in those shoes. However, at this point, we know what the acute stresses are going to be on this ongoing pandemic. Things could be shut down. There could be another variant. Things might improve. You kind of know the variables now more than we did before. So it's somewhat chronic, but really less so than previous. So it is, again, that perception and maybe a bit of reframing and a bit of planning as to what happens if this happens versus that happens, because frankly, things will be unpredictable for a while. Right. Very good. Lisa, anything to add to that? No, Very that's good. wonderful. Thank Very you. Good. Now, I know everyone on this call is a proponent of this idea that there's a lot that we can do to care for ourselves under stressful circumstances, but there are times where we need to seek professional help. So Dr. Uh, Batla, I'm going to turn to you for, for this question. Uh, when should someone seek professional help for themselves? And then part B of that question is, uh, when should we encourage someone of our staff team to also receive professional help? And how might I do it? Yeah, so I, I have a feeling Lisa might have some thoughts on this one as well, but I'll start off. Mm -hmm. um, there's no clear line. So let me start off there because you, you can't be absolutely sure. So a lot of terms that are used uh, in the English language are also used by mental health professionals. When it comes to depression, we all have some days when we're not feeling as good. We call that maybe I'm depressed today, very different from a biological depression that needs treatment from a professional, maybe medication, maybe something else. So uh, our language isn't very helpful. Stress and burnout. For some people, it's literally, I'm stressed, I'm feeling a bit burnt out, I'm going to be okay next week. For some people, stress and burnout actually is cr pretty clearly a pretty profound depression or a serious anxiety illness. So I would say if, if something is starting to affect your functioning and your relationships over a reasonable period of time, classically we use two weeks, but there's no... Uh, no real major science around that one. But if things have 
changed and deteriorated in your personal life, relationships, uh, ability to handle things, it's time to at least get an evaluation. Uh, uh, often I say go to a primary care provider. Hopefully most people, not all unfortunately, have a family physician. Great place to start. And they may, may recommend nothing, maybe something for sleep, maybe some cognitive behavioral therapy uh, or whatever. But an evaluation can't really hurt at that point. So Thank important you. to seek out help when you need it from a professional, at least the evaluation piece. Uh, and these days I find there are a fair number of people who come to see me and my response is, you know what, you're gonna be okay, you need this, 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 uh, but uh, you don't need medication, uh, nothing's terribly wrong. You're actually in a pretty tough time these days and you're coping better than you think. So yeah. you, you can get that response as well. And that assurance must mean something to them. Absolutely. For sure. Lisa, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, for sure. To Dr. Batla's point, when we're training in mental health and wellness courses, we talk about the mental health pillars, the way we feel, think, and act. And if you think about this for a second, the way you're feeling, thinking, and acting, if you're well, you're going to stand high on those pillars. But when things start to get a little shaky in the way that you're feeling, thinking, or acting is not normal or not optimal, that's when you should be starting to look out for help. And so to Dr. Batley's point, when we start to recognize those types of signs or symptoms in ourselves or others, it's definitely time to reach out. And, you know, I think that the other thing I'd like to encourage people to know that are on the line today is that there are different forms of professional help. And so uh, certainly starting with a primary care provider or a family doctor or something like that is always ideal. But for folks that don't have that or maybe inclined not to, to take those services, then there are other things as well, right? We could share things like crisis lines or distress lines. There are um, lots of counseling services available um, that don't necessarily need a doctor's referral, something that would be short term, maybe to help through a critical stress moment. So there are lots of different types of professional help if someone wasn't that inclined to go straight to an MD. Very good, thank you. Nancy, anything to add to this one? Yeah, I think uh, the, the only thing I would add is that in terms of speaking to somebody else, if you feel that um, they may need some support, I would talk to them the same way Dr. Batlin and Lisa just talked to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, a very validating and sort of saying, particularly Dr. Batlin is this idea of, you know, it, it if these things have been bothering you for sort of two or three weeks, if you're having a hard time functioning, just have this evaluation, go see your primary caregiver. Um, you know, I used to run a mental health unit when I was in the UK, and then I came back to Canada and I noticed a, a marked difference in the, the stigma of mental health and professional support, um, where we in Canada were not faring as well as they do in the UK. It's mm -hmm. still got a lot of stigma around it, but it is unfortunate that people will often perceive, particularly entrepreneurs and small business owners, that any sort of extended duration of, of stress and anxiety is some sort of failing. When in actual fact, you know, as I was saying in the video, stress is how your body responds to your constantly changing environment. It's supposed to do that. And then that awareness that, that this is sort of how the brain is working can actually remind people that they don't need to worry unless, as Dr. Batla says, you know, functioning becomes difficult. It's sort of, I, I know I heard Dr. Batla speak once and I'm not going to say this verbatim, but the paraphrase was much like he said a moment ago. If you're sort of not experiencing some stress and anxiety right now, you might be worried about that <laughs> because it's kind of like we are in a stressful and anxious period of time and we need to look at ourselves and see how we can adapt and move forward in that. And it's the same when you're managing other people working in the mental health environment um, as a manager myself, I noticed the changes of the people around me, the employees and the staff, and it was being able to go to them again, back to what we started this whole conversation with being open, being honest with people and saying, this is what I'm noticing. You know, how do you feel you're faring at the moment? And has this been going on for a period of time? And that very gentle validating approach when we're dealing with employees, I think is super important in, in mm -hmm. having that conversation with them. 
I, I love <clears throat> what you said there, like not to diminish the collective stress we've all been through in this pandemic, but I mean, the only place for us to grow is through stress, right? That's when we unlock our, our resilience and our capability and, and so uh, how we perceive it. If we can perceive it in some cases as, as a growth opportunity, that's a positive way to look at it as well. Um, one of, yeah, yeah. Sorry, one of the things that, that I've studied over the years, and we don't have a lot of time to go into it, is the notion of um, post-traumatic growth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how we, as you were just saying, Suling, how resilient we actually are when we're able to step away from the immediacy of the anxiety and stress or um, the mental health concerns and get into the, our ability to reflect and build our self-awareness and learn from the situation that's going on, reducing those shoulds, not starting with what am I doing wrong and build our resilience from there um, and turn it into a growth opportunity, as you just said. And, and again, going back to sort of the tendencies of entrepreneurs and small business owners, if we could just flick that on for, for ourselves, that would really be supportive and all the other things that we have to do and um, in rebuilding the economy and rebuilding our businesses and being again, active uh, contributors to the community, mm -hmm. remembering that strength that we innately have. Mm -hmm. So I, I do wanna go back to that quick question though, I had addressed to Dr. Batla about if we see someone on our team who we feel may require professional help, either for just counseling or for addictions, is do you have a tip on how we might approach that? Because obviously it would be a sensitive subject. Yeah, so this is partially answered already. Uh, yeah. And I think I, I liked the answer and I love the uh, sort of analogy uh, with if you see someone bleeding, you check in on them, yeah. right? You'd ask a question, you'd be curious, you wouldn't just walk on by. So the most important thing you can do is not ignore it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think checking in with someone in, in a way that's just uh, an honest, um, uh, how are you doing? Everything okay? Uh, something's a bit different. However you work that relationship, mm -hmm. uh, that type of language would be appropriate. But a caring comment and saying, I noticed something can make a big difference. I think Lisa said someone just popped their head through the door and said, hey, everything okay? Very casual. Mm -hmm. uh, and back to very early on, we heard from, uh, I think it was Brett, uh, who said, you know what, he kept his team together as much as possible so mm -hmm. you could actually have those moments it's pretty rare on a zoom type situation to pop in on someone and say hey you're doing okay because mm -hmm. a you probably don't know mm -hmm. so uh those relationships uh that are set out early on uh, allow that to happen a lot easier very good so i have one final question and then i might turn it over to each of you to share any resources that you might recommend um, Given this, the pressure of homeschooling, which I can personally attest to, <laughs> um, additional daycare responsibilities, work stress, what do you recommend for finding balance for the entire family, uh, family unit? Very important question nowadays, Su Ling, and I'm like you, I'm a homeschooling working professional as well. So I hear the, the folks on the line that are asking about these questions and how do we find balance in our family unit? Because mm -hmm. it's hitting us from all directions right now, like never before. And so as a parent of a young one and my partner, we're both working professionals. Um, I hear the parents that are asking this question. Mm -hmm. And it really is a very challenging time to find that balance. Um, because not only are we leading our families and leading our businesses, but we're also experiencing the pandemic and the effects of the pandemic at the same time. And so I'd encourage people to go back to the basics, uh, make time for the things that are important to you and your family. So maybe that's picking a night of the week where, you know, child number one gets to do something fun and child number two, and then mom gets to do something fun or the partner gets to do something fun. Um, you know, and, and trust me that the work is going to wait. No one's going to do it for you while you're off having fun and rebalancing your family. But please remember that your family is what you have when the work is done. 
-hmm. And so doing those small things to find that balance is going to go a long way. And I would really encourage people to be on the line uh, when it comes to the time with your families. Please make sure, even if it's the hardest thing you do in the day, make sure that you can give them your best at the end of the day. So uh, shut down, power down that work mode when you can and have those find those little moments that matter most with your family is going to go a long way at rebalancing a busy family during a very challenging time. Thank you. Speaking of perception, I know I speak to other <clears throat> moms with school age kids who are busy professionals and we were laughing that now that the kids are back pre pandemic, our full time jobs seemed so stressful, but <laughs> coming out of it with the, having gone through homeschooling now full time jobs are nothing compared to full time jobs plus homeschooling. <laughs> so the perception has changed considerably. <laughs> um, Nancy or Dr. Bale, anything to add to this one. Well, my uh, my kids are in their 20s and long gone now. So this this wasn't a part of the last couple of years for me. But I just want to add something. And Lisa was sort of talking about it, you know, carving out that time and everything. Um, one of the things we, we, we know is that the sincerity of the communication and with everybody is super important. Mm -hmm. And I think in the family environment, and my husband and I were very careful about this when the kids were at home, is when we were talking to them, we actually looked at them. I mean, when you think about it, quite often you're talking to people and you're doing something else and the kid is over there or whatever, and you're asking them how they are, but they're over there, you know, and just redirecting your focus, even for 30 seconds, looking at someone. I'm sure, Lisa, when your, your colleague put their head through the door, they were looking at you and, and showing in their body language and their facial expression that communication of in this moment, I am here for you. I might not be five minutes from now, but in this moment, I'm I'm here for you. And I know just in the family dynamic, that was super important. Our family is to look at somebody when you're asking them how they are. God knows how often it's like, hey, how are you? You know, like walk past and that's it. So okay, good. Thank you. Dr. Batlow. Yeah, just one, one thing to add. Uh, I'm also not in that situation where I have really young ones, but uh, end up uh, treating a lot of people who have young ones. And they tell me a really important thing is to establish the routine. And I do mm. encourage that. Yeah, getting a routine for everyone in the family so they kind of know where they are or what they should be doing, et cetera, and then making those time. And Lisa alluded to a bit of a routine, actually, in terms of mm. Wednesday is for this and this is for this uh, seems to have helped a lot of people. And it provides some certainty where there's so much uncertainty, for sure. Very good. Exactly. Thank you. So I know that through our Ontario Chamber that we released a, a, a couple of months ago what we call the uh, mental well-being place um, playbooks uh, for businesses. And uh, it's just some high-level recommendations about what business owners and entrepreneurs can do to um, provide some wellness in their workplaces. So those are on our website. And I know our local health unit also has some uh, resources on their website. But I thought I might ask each of you to share some of your favorite resources that people could use um, as well. I know we've touched on a few here, but if you could say what your top ones are that you might recommend for our business community, that would be great. So can I start with you, Lisa, maybe? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So I have put my email into the chat there. So I'd be glad to touch base with anyone that wanted more information. But some of the resources that St. John can share, um, you know, most people, when they think about St. John Ambulance, they think about first aid and CPR, but little do they know that we have a whole suite of mental health and wellness courses, some dating back pre-pandemic and some that were launched during the pandemic, actually. And so uh, we have lots of training resources for business owners, operators, entrepreneurs, staff members, managers, et cetera that can help them to develop some of the confidence in skills uh, that we talked about today. And so I'd be happy to share that. And the other thing that I'd be really happy to share, and it's just a fun one, but it's called a seven day wellness challenge. Mm -hmm. And so again, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't prepare myself with the link I should have, but nope. uh, I can send over that paperwork to anyone who would want it. It's a really fun challenge to put out into your workplace or just something to do personally, uh, a seven day wellness challenge. So I'd be really glad to share that too, just to help people towards resilience and to help reducing those stress levels over the next week. Fantastic. Thank you. Dr. Batla? Yeah, I, I noticed in the chat someone put in uh, Ottawa Public Health. Excellent uh, place to go for a lot of information. So that's one uh, I would certainly concur with. 
uh, for people who um, have potentially a bit more uh, serious mental health illnesses. Uh, the, the Royal is here in our community. It should be used when needed. Uh, and you can go to the webpage at the Royal, a lot of uh, resources there as well. Yes, and we're very lucky to have the Royal Ottawa here in Ottawa. And uh, I have, I was, I was going to brag and show you that I have the app that you have, the Healthy Minds app as well, uh, that you created. And it's just a way to check in with yourself every day as well. Very good. Nancy, I'll just leave the final to you. Do you have any resources that you recommend? I'm a big proponent of guided meditation because a lot of people struggle with doing meditation, which is very good for the breathing and, and calming oneself down. So I would encourage people to go on to any of the like Android or, or Apple Play Store type things and, and download some guided meditation. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, it, it can be super useful. Um, I put in the chat, uh, my direct link to my MeQ test, which is all about self-awareness. And a lot of what we've been talking about is self-awareness. You know, am I feeling an extraordinary amount of stress or, or whatever? What am I shooting on myself, et cetera? So mm -hmm. I encourage people to take that test and then they'll receive additional information of where they are in that journey. And as I mentioned in the video, if anybody has any questions of the things that I brought up during the video, do feel free to just email me at nancy at nancymorris.com. Happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, that, that's about it. Plus the resources that you're providing, Sue Lang, the two playbooks, which mm -hmm. you know we've looked at. There's phone numbers in there, the distress center that Lisa was alluding to before, you know, things like that, useful pieces of information for employers, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, as all of you know, uh, our main mandate is uh, to ensure that we have a healthy economic um, uh, culture within our community. And uh, we've always known that mental well-being uh, plays an important part of that and even even more so now. And I think, you know, there are a lot of lessons that we've all learned throughout this pandemic and things that have been highlighted that we maybe knew before, but we didn't focus on. And I think the idea of integrating mental well-being as a business strategy, as something that um, supports our overall economic health and growth, um, is something that we're not that we're not going to let go of. So I appreciate uh, your time and contributions, both through the work that you do. So I'll just say I'm honored by your support and appreciate it. And we look forward to continuing to work with all of you.